Thank you so much for choosing me today. So today I am bringing you another True Crime Tuesday video where I will be talking about yet another serial killer coming out of South Africa. So for today's video, I'm going to be talking about the Jesus killer, Jimmy Maketa. This case actually gave me so much chills in comparison to the ones that I've covered so far because when it came to Jimmy Maketa, he did not have a preference, okay? And you will see why as we go on with the story. I feel like the worst thing that could hit planet Earth is a serial killer who does not have a preference. He targeted men and women within a specific township. And he was considered to be one of South Africa's deranged serial killers. And to me, deranged, that particular term just gives me chills. And it just shows how cold he was because he literally attacked anything that moved. Needless to say, Jimmy had a major psychological issue. But without rambling too much, let's get into this case. Jimmy was born in 1964 in Cape Town. He was one of 15 children and he had a troubled childhood and this showed itself in his life. He would run away from home, he would run away from school multiple times. His behaviours displayed signs of a troubled child and that thing about him set him apart from other children but in a negative way. Jimmy ended up living in the bushes after he had completed sixth grade. He started stealing, but his crimes became more and more serious as time passed by. At some point in his life, he left for Mitchell's Plain to live with his sister. Jimmy engaged in bestiality and animal cruelty. Now, I'm not going to go into what bestiality is you can take your time to research what that is but all you need to know is that it is pretty vile and when it came to animals he found pleasure in harming them or killing them and animal cruelty seemed to be a pattern in his life as well jimmy actually got married in his adult life he was married to janetta when jimmy and janetta had gotten together they were very much in love Nothing about Jimmy seemed out of the ordinary. Janetta explained that he was so charming. Um, you know, he, he was her dream man. But according to Janetta, when they got married, literally on that day, a light switched. She said he began showing her his true colors. Janetta began to experience Jimmy's dark side. Jimmy was, um, he was described to be a loner. He was described to be charming and he actually liked keeping neat. But at some point you would see that something is quite off with Jimmy. Jimmy and Janetta had three kids together. Now, unfortunately, this was a very unhealthy marriage. It was toxic. Jimmy was very, very abusive. Janetta tells a story of how on the day that they got married, when they got home, he started abusing her physically and Jimmy would physically abuse her in such a way, so viciously, that blood would splatter onto the walls of the room that they were in. And she goes on to explain that for two years, she would just look at her blood on the wall until she eventually decided to clean it. But he became almost animalistic. He was so violent towards her that, as I said, blood would splatter everywhere. So you can imagine the impact that she would endure from him. But the thing that became the last straw for Janetta was when Jimmy had an affair. When that happened, she decided, you know what, enough is enough. She got a divorce and forbade him from ever seeing her or his kids. Now, mind you, this is someone who looked timid and he looked incapable of hurting anyone. 
Now, despite Janetta and Jimmy's unhealthy relationship, Jimmy was actually a hands-on dad. Janetta says that he enjoyed taking them out. He actually spoiled them and always made a day out of everything. He genuinely, genuinely loved his children. Now, when Janetta forbade him from seeing them after the divorce, this sent Jimmy into a frenzy, a deadly frenzy. It would be the town of Philippi in Cape Town that would feel Jimmy's wrath. He would target victims from a distance on a hill. He would watch them for a while until they are eventually close enough to him to confront. Jimmy's killing spree would begin on April of 2005. Jimmy preferred couples. He would kill the man then rape the woman and finally kill her too. Now Jimmy's weapons varied as well, okay? He would go between using a hammer to using wooden poles, wooden or steel poles, or even hacking people to death with an axe. And the thing about Jimmy is the fact that he would always target the forehead. So you would see it coming, which is the most frightening thing to think about for these victims. Now, here's the weird thing about this case, okay? And I honestly don't understand because now bodies would be found in an irrigation dam or, you know, in the bushes where Jimmy would attack and con or confront and attack these victims. But when police were alerted about these bodies that were found, for some reason, there was a lack of urgency coming from the police. Now, I can never tell you why a murder, even if it was one murder, why there was no lack of urgency for that. I don't know if it's because this was a poor area and usually the poor are not taken very seriously because if this was in a rich area, trust and believe the media would be all over the situation or the police would be all over the situation. But for some weird reason, the police were just not engaging. They were not, or, or, or rather should I say in the beginning, they were just, it was just not clicking for them, which is wild to me because it shouldn't take several bodies for the police to act like one day. Is enough. Instead, the police didn't want anything to do with the media. They did not want the media covering all these bodies that were popping up in this town because they believed that the media was scaring people. And while that is true, but you can't keep something like this away from a town because then how would the people be prepared? And they were just not considering the possibility that there is a serial killer on the loose because they felt these were all random deaths, which is, which is surprising. I mean, not that that's unheard of, but usually when there are deaths close together in a particular town, one would kind of think there's a serial killer first, but for the police, they felt like, no, this is actually random deaths. Now, one could say that they were probably thrown off because there, were, there was no particular killing pattern because the serial killer, before they knew who he was, or the deaths rather, were killed in various ways, or the victims, sorry, were killed in various ways. But anyway, the town of Philippi was very fearful regardless because Nobody can deny the fact that there's something going on in the town. Now, four victims had described the killer to have Jesus in charcoal across his forehead. And this was how he became to be known as the Jesus killer. It was kind of like he was playing God. For two months, though, the killing had stopped. Okay, so this was a sense of relief and the town of Philippi felt like, okay, things were normalizing again. They, they didn't catch the killer, but at least people are not dying. But this was for a solid two months. 
However, in October of 2005, the killings resumed, unfortunately. By October, eight people were found dead and six were raped. Victims were almost always thrown into the nearby dam. As I said, with the lack of interest from the police, which I will never understand why, police could not confirm to the community that there was a serial killer. Now, the police were so laxy daisy about the killings to the point where the killer himself contacted authorities. Write letters also claiming to be the Jesus killer, so he identified himself as the Jesus killer. And he would even go as far as drawing maps and posting it to the to the local authorities, leading them to where some of his victims were buried or thrown. And the killer was so cheeky that he even warned of future murders. And you know, something interesting that I read about serial killers in Pete Bailafeld's book. Pete Bailafeld was one of the top detectives, like top three in the world from South Africa, who also specialized in serial killings and he helped in capturing some of South Africa's worst, including serial killer Cedric Marke, which I've covered that case before. You can check in my true crime playlist for that. Anyway, in his book, he talks about how serial killers almost want to be caught. It's like they feel a sense of relief when they are able to just regurgitate or expose all of their dark secrets. So this case with Jimmy reminded me of that fact that he was kind of desperate for the police to, to find him. But at the same time, he would hide away from them because... He also does not want to get caught, but he wants it to be known that he is definitely killing these people. It's a weird concept, but serial killers find relief when they eventually um, testify or when they eventually confess to their murders. Now, at this point, residents were just so over it, they couldn't take... Uh, the non-urgency coming from the police so they started to take the law in their own hands and they started patrolling to find this killer they would see him in a distance or they would see somebody on the hill but when they approach the hill that person has disappeared in november of 2005 an arrest had been made a man was found in a bush a picture is published exposing his identity Except there is one problem. The victims who made it out alive do not recognize the arrest that has been made. And it turned out that they actually could not link the suspect to any of the murders or rapes. Now, when they had realized that they actually captured the wrong man, first of all, he was not linked to any crime so I guess against the DNA that they would have accumulated he did not make a match and also physically when they looked at him physically he was a 49 year old man who they knew for sure looking by his physical body that there was no way he could have overpowered the male victims that had been killed. Now they had found this gentleman when the police had gone on a manhunt in the town of Philippi. They came across him in a bush, but it turns out that he was the wrong person. So the killer was still out there. And this man had been so humiliated because he was branded, was wrongfully branded, the Jesus killer in newspapers. And his reputation had been soiled, had been damaged. Now come December 2005, 14 people had been murdered and 22 had been raped. Now this was a total, total nightmare. Just when the community thought there was some kind of breakthrough with an arrest being made, it was actually the wrong person and the killer was still out there. And one of the reporters that took on this, this story said she felt so sorry for 
the residents of this town because their infrastructure was so bad so there were no burglar bars to protect them there were no steel gates so they were basically so exposed to this killer this deranged killer who is showing mercy to to no one now upon investigation police or local authorities found a cell phone that was left behind at one of the crime scenes now when they had looked at the call log the police decided to contact the most called number on the phone i believe that number that was you know frequent on that cell phone was called like eight times and this number was answered by a gentleman in Hrabo. And the gentleman who answered the phone call was a man named Daryl. And Daryl so happened to be the killer's son. Now while this is going on, the police managed to get a hold of Daryl, the killer's son. And we actually learned that Jimmy or the serial killer rather had been out on parole for attempted murder this phone call would lead police to the killer himself identified as jimmy maketa and when he was arrested jimmy looked like the most unlikely suspect the people of philippi learned that he had been caught and when he would go to to court and attend his trial they were so mad they wanted his blood there would be you know rioting outside not rioting that's a strong word they would be like protesting outside of the courthouse now at first the police could not confirm that he was linked or responsible for all the murders at least not yet and jimmy started writing again he started writing letters to the captain who was taking over his case captain morris he started writing due to a suggestion given to him by captain morris now obviously this is to get him to confess but i don't think everyone was was expecting him to confess so much like he just let everything out he just spilled and spilled and spilled and again he drew maps and showed police exactly where he hid bodies where he threw bodies and the detail of it all he detailed every single thing and what's weird about jimmy is the fact that he was shocked when he learned that the police used that information against him he genuinely thought that he is he is writing a letter to captain morris out of like friendship because there was like a bond that they had that that was born out of their you know uh, communication so he felt like he could trust captain morris so he was taken aback when he learned that his letters would be used as evidence against him now, what I didn't mention before is that Jimmy had married a second time. Of course, before he was apprehended, he was married to Anna. And Anna had taken him in after Janetta threw him out. And unfortunately, Anna suffered the same kind of abuse. And she was convinced that he was capable of murder because of how vicious he was. When she heard about all the deaths in Philippi, there was no doubt in her mind. Like she was so sure that yes, he's definitely capable of that. Now, they had married his letter against all the case dockets. And this is how they were able to confirm that he was definitely responsible because the letter, the case dockets were similar. They matched. Jimmy also explained how he had like a lion or like a demon inside of him that was just raging and just wanted to tear everything apart. One of Jimmy's main issues was Janetta, his first wife, and he actually blamed her for everything. He blamed her because he forbade him from seeing their children. And the fact that he couldn't see his children 
really got to him to this point. So he mentions in his letters that he completely blames Janetta for everything. If it wasn't for her, then people probably would have survived. So Jimmy says. Jimmy pleaded guilty to 46 charges. 18 rape, 16 murders, 6 house break-ins, 2 robberies, 2 attempted murders, and 2 assaults. DNA and eyewitnesses would also not work in his favor, so he matched with the DNA samples that the police had accumulated and of course the eyewitnesses had recognized him but what made this case airtight was the fact that he confessed to all the murders or the ones that he was willing to talk about in his letters so that is what sealed the deal for Jimmy. Jimmy actually enjoyed the media attention so as timid as he looked he actually loved the fact that all eyes were on him. Jimmy was considered a dangerous psychopath who lacked remorse. A psychologist even said that Jimmy couldn't perceive emotion and this is what set him apart his whole life. So what would happen is even when his victims would plead and plead for their lives, obviously he loved having power over them and he he usually targeted people who were drunk and some of these people didn't even know that they were being assaulted or being raped because he would purposefully target drunk people. It was just an easier target for him. Even if he would be begged, you know, to spare, like victims would say, just do anything to me, but please don't kill. He would kill them anyway. It doesn't matter how much they begged. He was so stone cold. It didn't ring a bell to him. It didn't. It made him feel absolutely nothing and he killed them anyway. He knew their fate, whether they begged or not. Jimmy was sentenced to 1,340 years on the 3rd of May 2007. And that, my friends, is the Jesus Killer case. Let me know what you feel about this case. Did you know about this case? What do you think about this case? If there's anything that I have missed, please let me know in the comment section. Otherwise, give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Don't forget to comment, like, subscribe, share, and all the shenanigans. Thank you so much for listening. You may have noticed by now that this was audio only. I do appreciate everyone who takes the time to listen. And if you feel that there's a case that you'd like me to cover, feel free to let me know in the comments. It's as easy as that. Otherwise, I will see you in my next video. Cheers.